Welcome to the program where instead of despairing about crime, you can actually help us to do something about it. Uh, it's live, of course, and the officers waiting for your call are investigating some very serious offences, including a double murder, a racist attack, and a major case of arson that we've reconstructed. The number to help with all tonight's appeals is 01 8055. Last month, 150 people rang about the murder of London restaurateur John Gasper, who managed the Pizza Pomodoro in Soho. Someone had forged a letter to get spare keys to Mr Gasper's flat, and late on Monday the 10th of November, he was shot dead as he went through his front door. Police are anxious to speak again to a man who calls himself Pizza. He's already called twice, once to the studio just after last month's programme, and then again later at four in the morning to the police incident room. He clearly wants to help, so if Pizza is watching now, please will you call us again here in confidence on 01 811 8055. Ask for Detective Sergeant Robertson. No fewer than 670 viewers called in about attacks on elderly people in Northamptonshire. We showed how at least two men have been roughing up old people in their homes and robbing them of their life savings. A car police wanted has now been traced, and this Polaroid was also identified, and it too has been eliminated. As a result of the programme, officers from Cambridgeshire and Kent recognise similarities with offences in their areas and they're pooling information. Now, if you can help, please call us here. Next, football violence and the murder of a Crystal Palace fan, Terry Burns. Over 20 people had been charged with offences surrounding the murder, but we showed a photo of a man who's nicknamed Scouse, whom detectives still wanted to interview. Three viewers called in and gave his real name, and then Scouse himself walked into Cannon Row Police Station in London. He was arrested and interviewed, but has since been released. Inquiries are continuing and is to be questioned again next week. Remember, you may remember last April we reconstructed a savage burglary in Southport in which a jeweller, Peter Joannides, was shot and critically wounded. Partly as a result of our reconstruction, detectives investigated one man in particular. And this month he faced trial charged with aggravated burglary and possessing a firearm. Now, crucial to the case was a tape recording of the robber's voice, a recording we played on Crime Watch. Early in the court hearing, an expert in voice identification, a witness for the prosecution, changed his evidence. The trial was then halted and the defendant was discharged. And this is, in fact, the first acquittal of someone who's been arrested as a result of information from Crime Watch viewers. Last September, two viewers named a man wanted after a robbery on a North London building society. The suspect fled from his home after the programme, but he's since been traced. And earlier this month, he was arrested and charged. He's currently remanded in custody, awaiting trial. You may have heard how recently an armed man died from gunshot wounds during a chase in Stockton. Police believe the man may have been responsible for a series of armed robberies at supermarkets, which we appealed about in November. He may also have been responsible for the murder of the Leeds policeman, Sergeant Speed, in October 1984. In fact, earlier today, police investigating that murder charged an associate of the dead gunman with conspiracy to rob and firearms offences. Well, now to our first case this month. Most murders are committed by someone who knows his or her victim and who has a very clear motive. Cases of indiscriminate killers who kill more than once are rare. But last month, it seems that one man met and then murdered two young women in the space of 36 hours. And police are convinced that this is the type of killer who will attack again. So your help on this next case is vital. Our reconstruction starts on the night of Saturday the 24th of January in the Bayswater area of West London. Marina Monte was a heroin addict who worked as a prostitute to finance her habit. She was 27. She had no family in England, only a boyfriend who was also an addict. On the night she died, she set out at about 10.30 to look for business around Bayswater and Paddington. She usually headed towards Sussex Gardens, but there'd still been no specific sightings of her that evening. Her killer may have been among her first clients. Mitre Bridge Railway Junction, Scrubs Lane, three miles from Paddington. At about 11 o'clock that night, the signalman noticed something unusual. A car turned into the service road beside the railway and stopped there for some four or five minutes. In the darkness, the signalman could see only that it was a small car. He couldn't make out what the driver was doing.
Marina's body was found there by a railway worker at 7.15 the next morning. She'd been strangled and her boots and handbag were missing. Rachel Applewaite also worked as a prostitute in the same area of West London. She was 23. Rachel lived in a DHSS hotel in Earl's Court with her 20-year-old boyfriend, Ian. They'd been together for six months and had frequent arguments, usually about money. I gave you some last week. I bloody spent it, didn't I? I need some more. I've got our clothes, haven't I? How much do you want? 20 quid. 20 quid? That's my money anyway. Rachel depended on Ian for friendship and companionship. She rarely saw her family. Her mother was in hospital and her father and sister lived in Oxfordshire. On the afternoon of Saturday the 24th of January, the same day that Marina died, Rachel and her boyfriend watched television in their tiny hotel bedroom. They were there until 6.30 and it was time to go out looking for business. Nothing else on? I just came here to turn it on. Rachel had moved to London some four years ago and had worked as a prostitute ever since. She could be loud and aggressive and had an increasing drink problem. Shortly before 7pm, they arrived at Cleveland Terrace, where Rachel usually stood waiting for passing motorists to pick her up. She was soon approached by a man in an orange mini. OK. OK. Ian always checked out the customers. She usually spent 20 minutes to half an hour with each customer, but it was two hours before she reappeared at Cleveland Terrace. She was drunk and Ian was furious. Where the bloody hell have you been? I know, Johnny Ryan. You've been drinking. A cab driver witnessed the row and anyone else there would remember it too. The cab driver saw them disappear in opposite directions. Ian got back to the hotel at about 11 o'clock, but he didn't see Rachel again that night or ever. Nine to six, where's nine? Nine to six, on its own. Well, who put this one there? Me. The next anyone heard of Rachel was the following day, Sunday, at around 12.30. Her father was making his daily visit to her grandfather in an old people's home in Oxfordshire. Hello, Dad. Are you still at the hotel? No, I'm not there anymore. I'm staying with a friend at the moment. He didn't know That's where she was ringing from or why she rang him that day. Yeah, well, look, I've got to go now because my money's running out. Well, look after yourself then. Goodbye. But at 9.30 that Sunday night, Rachel was seen with a man and a girlfriend in the King's Head pub, Edgware Road. And again, she was heading for a row. If she comes over here, she's bloody going to get a load up and I'll bloody sort her out. <laughs> the girls who were laughing at her noticed she was wearing an odd, rather old-fashioned two-piece outfit that was much too big for her. Oh, no. I'd love to know if she gets her gear from. It really is something of a joke. How not to look? And she was attracting further ridicule at the pool table. It's like a grotesque little man, isn't she? <laughs> Rachel had had enough. <laughs> it was a fight that everyone in the pub that night certainly witnessed. Closing time was 10.30. The events which followed the fight are crucial if police are to find her killer. No, just forget it, all right? I'm going to the loo. Where Rachel went next is still a mystery. It was the last time she was seen alive. She tottered out of the pub, clutching a white plastic bag. The man she was with has still not been traced. A couple of minutes later, the man followed her out. Police don't know whether the two met up again outside. The next day at Sumner Place in Chelsea. 
There's a row of lock-up garages behind the flats there. At about midday, a resident returned to her garage after 24 hours away. Rachel's body had probably been dumped from a car, as Marina Montes had. And like Marina, she'd been strangled and her boots were missing too. Well, Detective Superintendent Jim Hutchinson, both Rachel and Marina worked around the same area and our map here shows where Marina went. We don't actually have much information about her, do we? No, she left the hotel at about 10.30 that night. We'd like to hear from anyone who saw her leave the hotel or saw her in that area because our next client could have been her killer. All right. Now, you have a lot more information on Rachel's movements before she died. First of all, the driver of the orange mini, which picked her up that Saturday night, he hasn't come forward. No, he hasn't, and that's uh, very important to us. Uh, she was off for a period of about two hours with him, and we'd like to know where she went, who she went with. It's, it's very important to us. She told her father on the telephone that she was staying with a friend. You don't know yet who that friend could be. No, that's correct. Uh, she did stay with a friend. We're, we're sure of that. We haven't found out who he is. But uh, she had a change of clothing, you see. Um, the clothing you see on the screen at the present moment is actually the clothing she was wearing. That's the only picture we have of the actual clothes she wore. Yes, that's true. Now, that clothing is vital to us because she changed into it. Her boyfriend hasn't seen it before. It may lead us to the friend or indeed give us vital information. It had a label on the uh, back of it, Sue. Uh, you can see on the screen it was Warren Petit. Um, that's the manufacturer. But there were two names on it. And uh, with the use of ultraviolet, we managed to bring up the name P. Suarez and also the initials TK. We'd like to hear from either P. Suarez or TK, uh, who are able to say, well, that's a uniform that I wore, because I think it probably belonged to someone working into the hotel or catering trade. Right. Absolutely vital. Yes. The other thing is that the man seen drinking with her that last night in the King's Head in Edgware Road hasn't come forward either. No, he hasn't, and, and he definitely is vital to our inquiry. Yes, he's a man of uh, continental appearance, probably Greek or Arabic, He's about 5'9 in, in height, aged 35 to 45. Uh, he, his hair is black and it's got uh, specks of grey in it. He's wearing gold rim spectacles. And uh, although we're not sure about the clothing, he may have had a ski jacket on. On his uh, left finger, or uh, finger of his left hand, he had a large medallion ring. Mm. And somebody must have seen her at closing time after when the pub closed that night. In the oh yes, road. certainly. She was very, very drunk and she couldn't have got away from there uh, on her own. She may have been pushed into a vehicle. It's vital that anyone who saw her on the busy edge of a road at about half past ten that Sunday come forward and talk to us. Is it possible that other prostitutes might be able to help? Uh, yes, there's a, a possibility. Many of the girls actually travel down from the uh, Midlands, from Coventry, Nottingham and Huddersfield. Many of these girls haven't appeared on the streets since. They can indeed help us. We'd like to hear from them. Mr Hutchinson, thank you. And if you think you can offer any information about either Rachel Applewaite or Marina Monte, and particularly their movements over that weekend, beginning the 24th of January last month, please ring us in the studio here on 01 811 8055 or call the incident room at Kensington Police Station on 01 741 6212. That's 01 741 6212. The Magpies are at it again. This week, the government relaunches its campaign against burglary, urging all of us to be more security conscious. Don't let them get away with it. At least half a million houses are broken into every year. That's one household in every 40. And what's more, a Home Office study published today, shows that the emotional effects of burglary are often far, far greater than the practical effects, and much more than people have generally supposed. Most burglars are very young indeed. In fact, the peak age is just 15. These are opportunist crimes for a video recorder or for cash. Relatively few housebreaks are professionals who plan their operations in great detail. To start with the professionals, you might be surprised to know that the burglary centre of Britain is the south coast seaside town of Brighton. 25 years ago, Brighton Corporation enforced a bylaw banning barrow boys from selling fruit and vegetables around the city and drove them out of business. So they turned instead to house clearance, selling old furniture and pictures to the numerous antique dealers in Brighton. From house clearance, they moved on to the practice of knocking on doors, trying to persuade people to part with their valuable possessions at ridiculously low prices. They have now become notorious as the Brighton Knocker Boys. 
There are now maybe two or three thousand of them operating right across much of England and Wales. And although they stay within the strict letter of the law, their tactics are devious and threatening. And there's definite evidence that some of them use the visit to case the house. Police warn that once a knocker boy has called, a burglary often follows. This was the case at Leon C in Essex. One day last December, a retired gentleman who'd lived alone in Lee for many years was visited by one of the knocker boys. Good morning, sir. I'm from Hoag. Anything to sell? Uh, you mean antiques? Well, not necessarily. Anything around 1920s or anything like that? No, no, I've nothing. That's a that. rather nice grandfather clock, sir. Oh, is it? Yes, yeah, so no. not interested in selling, sir? No, 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 no. No, I have nothing to sell. All right, thank you very much for your time. Good morning. A month later, the old man set out, as he did every evening, to visit friends. As usual, he left the light on in the hall. It was also his habit to leave the up and over garage door open. Sometime later, the burglar's car must have reversed into the garage. They closed the swing door behind them and went through to the back garden. They had no problem removing the louvered panes of glass from the kitchen window. The key to the French doors lay within easy reach. When the burglars got in, they found so many valuable antiques that they had to take extra bags from the house to carry them away. A neighbour passing later was surprised to see lights on and the garage door shut. Unfortunately for the old gentleman, he didn't think to call the police. They took a large collection of self porcelain, which would be irreplaceable, and a very fine picture by J.F. Herring, which also has great sentimental value, as it was left to me by an old lady, and um, some very, very fine clocks, which again are irreplaceable. It's over 40 years collecting, and uh, I was just shattered by it. So, um, as you can imagine, uh, I am devastated by it. Well, Detective Inspector Chris Nyland, that poor man made a lot of mistakes on security, didn't he? Yes, he did. It's the second biggest domestic burglary in the last 12 months. At least, he did make a lot of mistakes, but at least we have some photographs of the beautiful items that were stolen. This marvellous painting by J.F. Herring Sr., it's signed and dated 1841. It's worth £30,000. We believe the frame may have been broken during the burglary. Has it been offered for repair? That's what we're appealing for, repairers, etc., to come Restorers forward. Restorers might remember it. That's right. A truly beautiful collection of Sevres porcelain stolen, mainly 18th century. Every article very identifiable by its artwork, its colouring, its distinctive maker's marks on the underneath of most of the items. That's a very identifiable piece there, isn't it? It is. That's a beautiful Monteith, painted by three different uh, artists. Somebody must recognise that if they see it. I would hope so. Tragically, some of this was probably broken as well during the theft. And again, with the painting frame, has it been offered for repair? Restorers and these people like this, could they come forward? The trouble was they bundled everything into a bag. They were obviously surprised at the amount of That's stuff right. they found. They were surprised at what was in the house. Um, they took three bags from the house owned by the aggrieved. Where are they now? Have they been discarded by the thieves? The combination of the three bags, the navy canvas hold all, um, it's older than the one shown. And the, the real one is brown and green, I gather. That's right, it is. It's an old issue navy bag. The plastic patient's property bag. Again, identifiable. Old, the old Marks and Spencer's hold all, and that's been out of production for the last 14 years. Now, the combination of those three bags, identifiable. Does a dustman or anybody know where they are? Now, considering this was a lifetime's collection, it's almost incredible that he wasn't insured. It is. He couldn't afford the premiums, but he can now afford to offer a substantial reward for any information concerning this case. He wants his lifetime collection back. Right. Mr Lyon, thank you very much. And if you think you can help, please do call us on 01 811 8055 
or you can ring the incident room at Rayleigh, which is 0268 775533. That's 0268, the code for Rayleigh, 775533. We're now to more typical burglary, the sort that involves not precious antiques worth a quarter of a million, but a few quid nicked from down the road. It's called petty theft, but it's not petty at all. It's terribly distressing when it happens to you. Contrary to popular belief, it isn't the rich who suffer most from burglary, but, believe it or not, the poor. The last British National Crime Survey found that the poorest estates had burglary rates five times higher than the national average. Now, we all know that we can do a lot to protect ourselves, of course, and your local police station will have a crime prevention officer who will be pleased to come round free of charge and advise you on how to keep a record of serial numbers of video recorders and so forth, um, on locks, uh, on alarms, if you want, and indeed, how to security mark your property like this so that it'll show up under ultraviolet light. You could, uh, if you want, even consult the police about how to set up a local neighbourhood watch. But some crime prevention has less to do with the police than with the local council, especially where the council owns the housing. Thurnsco Pit is eight miles from Barnsley. On the outskirts of the village is the Thornley Crescent Estate. One in 12 homes here are burgled every year. Two thirds of householders are unemployed, many houses are damp and run down, and there's little respect for privacy or property. I came out last night from my friends. I found the door like this. They couldn't get in because I got a wheelbarrow and a box of toys at the back of me. But if they could have got in, they could have took my telly and my video. It was half past seven at night. Uh, somebody smashed my window with an house break. You always get somebody around trying to pinch things. But I can't afford to put, put glass back. When burglary and vandalism reach this sort of level, it's hard to convince victims that traditional crime prevention is of any use at all. Houses are very unsafe. In fact, it's like I said, it's a waste of time even locking the doors. I don't lock mine very often. But for the simple fact, I mean, if anybody wanted to get in, they'd have no problems whatsoever. They could get straight through that door. A more radical approach is needed. In effect, a redesign of the whole estate. And in Thornley Crescent, there is a plan to change the very conditions in which crime flourishes. The residents have worked with NACRO, the local council, police, local schools and an architect to develop some straightforward solutions. And the first problem that the estate suffers from is that there's a, a road right through the estate which is um, subject to abuse, particularly from motorcycles, lacks privacy and uh, isn't a particularly safe place for children to play. And we're proposing to convert it into four cul-de-sacs. Garden Street has always been a cul-de-sac and residents there certainly have had far less problems. Cul-de-sacs will certainly discourage joyriding, but the houses themselves still have no defence against stray dogs, litter or burglars. Much of the wooden fencing which used to divide one garden from another has been broken up and stolen for firewood. But a clear division between gardens adds to a sense of privacy. Another simple and durable solution, replace the old wooden fencing with solid brick walls, a physical and psychological barrier to any intruder. And when dilapidated houses can also be given a facelift by new brickwork, the residents really begin to feel more positive about their homes. And I'm looking forward to when the houses are done to move back into a safe, secure, warm, comfortable home. The plans include better lighting, better public telephones which work and in a place where burglars start at the age of four or five, play areas and a youth and community centre. The aim is to get more facilities for people, especially young people, and to get a kind of community spirit back in the area. In Thurnsco, the local authority have backed the project enthusiastically. But to work, here and elsewhere, crime prevention schemes like this require money and therefore political commitment. John Bright works for a voluntary organisation concerned with crime. John, these schemes look terribly expensive, are they? Crime prevention in these areas does not come cheaply. For example, replacing flimsy front entrance doors with, with strong ones with decent locks and frames can cost three to four hundred pounds apiece. Redesigning estates which have been badly designed can cost hundreds of thousands of pounds. Um, some, some measures can pay for themselves, but in general, if we're serious about reducing crimes in these areas, we have to invest sensibly in the housing estates. You're saying 
we keep going on about crime and feeling as though nothing can be done about it. Something can be done about it if we're prepared to put our money where our mouths are. Yes, indeed. There are some estates on which we've worked where crime has fallen quite dramatically as a result of the efforts of the council and the police and the youth service and a number of other agencies. What sort of measures have you done? Strengthening people's front entrance doors, window locks, installing entry phone systems, providing facilities for children and young people. And how much have you got crime down? Just a few percentage points or really radical drops? No, in some cases by 50 or 60 percent, but only when all of these measures have been introduced as a package. And what can ordinary people do? Presumably not a lot. Well, uh, tenants living on estates who are troubled by crime really need to join their tenants association or set one up or in some way try and lobby the council to introduce measures that will make their lives safer and more. Well, let's hope some uh, government ministers are watching and take note. Incidentally, uh, if you are the victim yourself of any sort of crime, it can be a terrible experience. And there are over 300 victim support schemes around the country. A trained volunteer will visit you at home, either to talk to you or give you advice on where you can get practical help. Your local police station or your town hall will tell you if there's a voluntary scheme near you. Well, now to the incident desk, where we invite the police to appeal to you directly. This month, WPC Jackie Johnson from Merseyside joins Superintendent David Hatcher from Kent. First, we want to trace about 30 partygoers who could help solve a vicious attack in London's East End. The attack resulted in this man, Trevor Ferguson, losing his sight in one eye and caused two families to move out of their homes. On Saturday the 3rd of January, a party was being held in Beaconsfield Road in Canningtown. It was a family birthday party and most of the guests were black. Around 1am on the Sunday and again at 3, fumes from some sort of noxious gas were sprayed through the open windows. It seems that someone at another party in Exning Road might have been responsible. Most of the guests there were young white people. Trevor Ferguson and another young man went round to ask them to stop and that's when Trevor was stabbed in the face and eye. Next morning another family in Beaconsfield Road discovered racist graffiti on their wall. It was the culmination of four years of harassment and both families have since been rehoused. When the house in Exning Road was searched, officers found this CS gas canister. But so far, we've only managed to trace three people who were there that night. If you were at Martin Kane's party on Saturday the 3rd of January, or you know someone who was, ring us in confidence. Next, detectives in Shropshire need your help. At 5.30pm on Monday, the 8th of December, an 18-year-old girl was grabbed by a man and bundled into his car. She was driven from Rodham Court in Newport to a lane at the bottom of Broomfield Road, where she was raped. Now, tonight, we, ha we have a combination of clues which might well identify the rapist. The girl helped us to produce a video fit. She thought he was about 40, of medium build, and had dark brown, greasy hair. He probably works outdoors because his face was weather-beaten and he had dirty, rough hands. And he was wearing a black or navy blue sweater with a lion motif like this. His car had one of these large puppies stuck inside the inside of the windscreen. She thinks a small teddy bear, maybe something like this, was hanging on a red ribbon from the rearview mirror. She remembered the interior of the car was beige and it smelt of a sickly air freshener. But now look at this artist's impression. We think it may be the same man. He seriously assaulted a woman in Stafford, only 12 miles from Newport, on the evening of Sunday the 4th of January. Both victims feel either, either face could match the man who attacked them. So if you know anyone who looks like either of these and has a poppy and a teddy bear in his car, please don't hesitate. Call us now. Next on Incident Desk, this man who's robbed building societies in Nottingham, Norwich and Sheffield. Here he is in action in Norwich in January, where he got away with £4,600 from the National and Provincial. We suspect he's not local to Norwich because he's carrying a Presto shopping bag, yet there's no Presto supermarket in the city. The glasses he wore were probably part of his disguise, and don't let the blonde hair fool you, it's almost certainly a wig, because he decided to dispense with it when he carried out a similar raid at the Abbey National in Nottingham on December the 17th. But notice how he's wearing exactly the same woolen hat and padded jacket. If you think you know him, please give us a ring. Since joining the Merseyside Traffic Division, I haven't yet had cause to stop one of these. They're vintage motorbikes and they belong to Keith Aston, a collector from Birmingham. In the early hours of Boxing Day, six bikes worth £10,000 were stolen from his garage. A vintage fella set, just like this one, was taken. The registration was EHA424, but it had a slightly smaller engine than this. 
A beautiful old James motorbike with a 225cc engine was also stolen. And there's the number again. It was registered back in 1922, and here's the logbook. The first proud owner would have paid about £55 for it then. It's now worth about 2500 But I like this one best. It's a 500cc Sunbeam from the 50s. This is an S7 model, but a grey S8 was stolen. The other three which went were a 50s Vincent, and from the 30s, a BSA and a Triumph. All Mr Aston's bikes are lovingly restored, and he would dearly like to get the stolen ones back. So if any of my colleagues in traffic or anyone else has seen any of them, do please call. And finally, we'd like you to take a look at this. It once belonged to Henry VIII's grandmother, Lady Margaret Beaufort, and was bequeathed to the nation on her death. It's very delicate, that's why I'm wearing gloves. It was used by medieval royals as a clothes chest when they were travelling from one country seat to another. Unfortunately, its counterpart has gone missing from the public record office at Chancery Lane in London. That's the place where the nation's most valuable historical documents are kept, from Doomsday Book to copies of Magna Carta. The chest was kept in the record office museum, but staff noticed it had gone missing last year. Prior to that, the building was being cleared of asbestos, so the keeper of the public record can't be sure that the chest wasn't carted away in a skip. Either way, whether it was stolen or not, if anyone watching tonight has seen one of these, please let us know so it can be returned for safekeeping at the public record office. Well, if you've seen that chest or any of those beautiful motorbikes, or if you can help with any of those cases, here's the number 01811 8055. Our final reconstruction tonight is a case of arson. And it's the most expensive crime we've ever covered on Crime Watch. The damage from this one case amounts to several million pounds. And there was a real risk of someone being killed or injured by the blaze or the explosions that took place. The target was an aerodrome in Wiltshire, home of a bug-eyed observation aircraft called the Optica. Now, the Optica does much of the work of a helicopter, but at a fraction of the cost. It's been much in the news, not least because the first plane to be sold crashed two years ago, killing the two police officers on board. An inquiry put the blame on human error, but the firm went bankrupt. 200 jobs were lost. A new company then took over. One Friday night earlier this year, almost all their aircraft were destroyed. This was Hangar 1. Seven finished opticas were stored here, along with a helicopter and two other aircraft. My first reaction was, uh, was sadness. But then, when it sank in what had happened, uh, the sadness turned to anger, because I know nobody was, was hurt in the fire, and it was only aircraft that were burned, but those aeroplanes, those seven aeroplanes of ours, represented thousands of hours of skilled technicians' work. With the problems we have had here in the past, we didn't deserve this to happen to us. And I was just very, very upset about it. Old Serum Airfield is two miles north of Salisbury. Hangar number two is Optica's factory, which escaped the fire completely. Apart from the Optica buildings on the airfield, there's a third hangar and some smaller buildings that are owned by the Ministry of Defence. Friday the 16th of January. That morning, an Optica flew in for servicing. The work would take all afternoon, and the plane was due to be collected the following day. It was parked outside the hangar. Inside Hangar 1, other opticas were being prepared for shows and trials around the world. It's 20 to 6. The works manager, John Thompson, checked that the hangar was secure. He was usually the last to leave. The serviced optica outside had also been locked, but the company had no overnight security guards. There's a sports centre on the airfield. The West Harnham under-14s were training there until 8.30. By 10.30, the airfield was deserted, apart from two security men employed to guard Ministry of Defence property. One was doing some repairs to his car. 
Optica's Hangar 1 was 200 yards away. Quick! A schoolboy, Nicholas Stoner, heard the explosions from a quarter of a mile away. As he watched, he noticed a white Audi driving slowly around the airfield. The guards had called the fire brigade, but the blaze was already out of control. You may have the fire engine. I'll check you outside the building. Right. Police know there was a number of onlookers at the airfield that night, but they've yet to identify them all. It's going up well, isn't it? Yeah, never mind about that. There's another fire engine coming, so you'd better move on. Clear the right. yeah. A couple gave a warning of a major hazard. There's a plane on fire over there for the tanker of aviation fuel next to it. Right. Got to be moved. Right. The tanker was pulled clear just in time. At the height of the blaze, a witness noticed two men leaving the scene in what was probably a beige cortina. Farman fought all night to put out the blaze. The final damage has been estimated at four million pounds. Inspector Terry Ford, what clues have you got to go on now? Well, as you saw from the film, there was a trail of, of material laid to one of the aircraft on the tarmac. It consisted of two types of material. Firstly, a blanket type of material. It may be curtain, but it has a blanket texture to it, which has the letter E embroidered in red upon it. It also has what appears to be two arrows, or possibly sevens, underneath the E. Somebody has to recognise that. Another piece of material as well you have with you? Yes, um, a cotton, a softer cotton material. This, again, we think may be curtain material with a very soft raised pattern upon it. Yes, very hard to, to see precisely what that could have come from. But if anybody recognises that, you want to know what it is? Yes, it's, it's possibly a curtain material, and I would really ask anybody who has any idea about this material to ring us tonight. What sort of motive? Who did this? Roughly what sort of person? Well, I think it's somebody who knew something about aeroplanes or who was instructed about... Uh, how to set fire to an aeroplane, because as again you saw from the film, they released the drain cocks on several of the air aircraft had been systematically opened and the fuel spread about before it was lit. And the motive? Well, we have have several lines of inquiry. The company, of course, have a large insurance claim pending. Probably someone who was to do with the company or around the company at the time? Well, perhaps. possibly, of course, it could be a grudge because people right. have been laid off by this company and the, the previous company that went into uh, receivership. Now, there are witnesses you still badly need to trace. There was a cyclist, I gather. Yes, near to the start of the fire, a man was seen cycling away from the direction of Salisbury in the direction of the Winterbournes, which are villages nearby, almost at the start of the fire, and I, I would dearly like to trace that man. And, of course, uh, there was the car, that white uh, Audi, which seemed to have the damaged bonnet or, or right wing. Uh, there was the couple, there's the top right-hand side there, the man uh, who warned about the tanker. 
And yes. uh, there was a woman with him, wasn't there? And uh, a beige Cortina with um, two men. Uh, we think it was a Cortina. We think it was a Cortina. We're not sure about that. OK, there's a reward. Yes, there's a £20,000 reward for information leading to the prosecution of the people responsible for this offence. Right, Inspector Ford, thank you very much indeed. If you think you can help, uh, the number here, 01811 Or you can call the incident room at Devizes. That's 0380 double seven three double one that's o three eight o the code for devices double seven three double one if you can't get through at the moment the lines here are open until midnight and we'll repeat the local numbers on the crime watch update at 20 to 12. the numbers are on cfax page 186 or if you prefer to write to us the address is crime watch uk bbc tv london w12 8qt I'm getting news and we've got some extremely good uh, calls with useful information about the murder of the two prostitutes in West London. Uh, a woman has called in who thinks she can identify one of the paintings. Don't worry too much about crime. Something's being done about it right now. So please don't have nightmares. Do sleep well. Good night. Good night.